Good evening and welcome to this candidate forum for the Campbell Union High School District. Campbell Union High School District elect trustees by area. Tonight, area two is represented by the three candidates who are running for the one open seat. My name is Sophia Cow, the president of Legal Women Voter Southwest Santa Clara Valley. Our, our league covered the cities of Los Gatos, Saratoga, Montesorino, Campbell, and a segment of West San Jose. So now I would like to introduce our voter service team who organized this forum tonight. We have Wendy Hendry, Dan Hendry, Gail Nishmuru, Tom Pickrell, Julie Reno Grabby, Amy Wu, Eleanor Yek and myself, Sophia Tao. And now I will turn this meeting over to our moderator for tonight's forum, Eleanor Yek, who is also our vice president in charge of voter services. Thank you, Sophia. My name as uh, Sophia mentioned is Eleanor Yick. I'm currently serving as our league's vice president in charge of voter services and the moderator for tonight's forum. Next slide, please. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters is a national grassroots organization. When you join your local league, and there are five in Santa Clara County, you automatically become a member at all levels. For example, if you join our league, you also automatically become a part of the League of Women Voters of the Bay Area at the state level and the national level. This candidate forum is being sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Southwest Santa Clara Valley, which covers again the cities of Los Gatos, Saratoga, Montesorino, Campbell, and a segment of West San Jose. What about the League of Women Voters? What do they do? The League of Women Voters has been empowering voters and defending democracy for over 100 years. The League has two distinct roles. It provides nonpartisan voter services and never endorses or opposes any political party or any candidate. But the League does advocate when we have studied an issue such as education or health care and have developed a position on it. Some other examples of our League's voter service program. Next slide, please are candidate forums like you're participating in tonight, pros and cons on the ballot measures, watch for our presentations in early October this year. We conduct voter registration activities and we encourage all voters to go to the website votersedge.org. We consider it one stop shopping for when you're getting ready to vote. You can find information about candidates, ballot measures, financing, et cetera. It is a nonpartisan site and it has excellent information. I also want to mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on all five of our local leagues websites, YouTube channels and other social media sites. Now, before we begin our actual forum, I'd like to highlight for our audience members some general information about the general election, which is coming up on November 8th, 2022, 2022. Your mail-in ballots will be arriving the week of October 10th. I want to caution everybody to look at the way your name is printed on the ballot that's being mailed to you. That is the exact same way you should sign your name on the back of the envelope. If you need additional information, you can certainly go to the Santa Clara County Registrar of Voters where you can track your ballot or check your registration status. And you see the two websites there. Next. As I mentioned, you will be receiving your mail-in ballot and you can return it in one of three ways. You can drop it in the mailbox at the US Post Office. You can drop it at a secure drop box or you can go to a vote center. And I'll mention a little bit more of that at the end of the forum. What is going to be on your ballot when it does arrive? You'll be voting for candidates for federal offices, candidates for state offices, in our particular case, one countywide office, the sheriff's office, 
some new assembly districts, 28, 26, and 23, some local town and city councils, some local school boards like tonight. And there are some local measures. For example, the Campbell Union High School District has measure O on the ballot, which is a parcel tax. Remember, if you want to look at your ballot before you actually fill it in, go to votersedge.org and you can type in your address or your zip code and get a copy of what your ballot is going to look like. Let's go on to the next slide, please. And let me move here. Uh, one moment here. I am now pleased to welcome and introduce the three candidates who are running for the one open seat in area two on the Campbell Union High School Board of Trustees. Candidates, when I call your name, would you please put your video on? And we'll do this in alphabetical order. So we'll begin with candidate Elizabeth Halliday. Hi, Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you. Next, David Lee Savis. Hi, David. And our third candidate, candidate Michael Winter. Good evening. Hello, Michael. Oh. Welcome. I want to alert the audience that the candidates will make their opening statements in alphabetical order. After the opening statements, candidates will respond to other questions in a randomized order. Candidates, we so appreciate your being here tonight. We know you're busy campaigning. We appreciate your taking time out of your schedule to meet with us. And audience members, lastly, I want to highlight for you some ground rules that the candidates have agreed to observe during this forum. The League supports the accepted norms of civil discourse, and in that light, the candidates have agreed to follow those norms that were outlined in a document that they received. For example, candidates have agreed not to interrupt each other and to follow the allotted response times. Candidates are reminded that they don't have to use the full-time allotment, but are requested not to exceed it. Candidates have also agreed to not personally name or disparage another person or candidate in their responses. Our timer for tonight's forum is League member Wendy Hendry. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, Wendy will give each candidate reminders as they answer questions about the time remaining and when their time has elapsed, for example, Timer on is when they begin to respond, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and stop. The candidates are reminded when the stop sign comes up, finish your sentence or finish your thought, and then we'll go on from there. This forum is scheduled to last approximately 45 minutes. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to introduce her or himself by specifically answering this question in their opening statement. What qualifies you to serve as a trustee on the Campbell Union High School Board of Trustees? After the opening statements, candidates will have between 45 and 60 seconds to answer subsequent questions, which have been answered through or which have been submitted through the registration process, obtained from social media sites, and or developed by league members. The moderator, that's me, will announce and enforce the time limits for each question. And lastly, the forum will close with the candidate speaking in a modified random order, reversed from the beginning, answering this question. What question do you wish you had been asked tonight? Why and how would you have responded? And candidates will have 90 seconds to respond to that question. And now let's begin the forum. And we will start with each candidate's opening statement, again, responding to what specifically qualifies you to be a trustee on the Campbell Union High School District Board of Trustees. Candidates, you will have 90 seconds and we will begin in alphabetical order with Elizabeth Halliday. Hi, good evening. And first I wanted to thank 
um, my opponents, David and Michael for being here. And I wanted to thank you of the League of Women Voters for hosting our forum. And for, I know all of the work that you put in to making this happen tonight. So thank you for your time. I've worked in the Campbell and West San, West San Jose area since 1999, and I've lived here since 2002. I have two associate's degrees, one in technical writing and in liberal arts. I've recently gone back to school to continue my education, and I have a lifelong love of learning. I have two children who are twin sons, and they just started as freshmen in our community public schools in our district. And for the last nine years, I've worked and volunteered at their K through eight school in various supportive roles while also working from home, providing proofreading, editing, and formatting, essentially documentation services and pursuing my own visual and written arts. I've also served on the Moreland School Board um, Communications Committee and have done various um, volunteer efforts for Project Cornerstone and Moreland Educational Foundation. I love the cultural diversity of this area, and that's why I chose to live here. I love to learn, and I deeply appreciate the perspectives of others. I'm a patient and empathetic person, and I like to take the time to consider and process information carefully. I see our public schools as the cornerstone of our community. Thank you. And our next candidate is David Lee Sabus. David? Good evening. Uh, thank you, Eleanor. I also want to thank um, thank Michael and Elizabeth. I don't even think of you as opponents. I and mean, we're all people who are concerned about our community. We want to help. We want to work for our students, and which is also working for our families. It's actually great and telling that in our area, there are actually three candidates who are willing to take out you know, time of their lives to, to do this and to directly get involved. Um, and I know that all of us, even if we aren't so lucky as to be elected, that we will still remain involved. Um, let's see, my background, my education background is I'm a graduate of Santa Clara University School of Law. And I also went from undergraduate, I went to UC Berkeley, where I majored in peace and conflict studies, a specialty in conflict resolution. Um, and I have recently worked um, as a corporate trainer at Tesla Motors. I've been involved in business development for different projects as well as um, when my daughter was in school, I was a part-time teacher at her K through eight middle school in Las Gatas. So I spent uh, very much a lot of time there. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm here and I feel I'm qualified is I'm a parent, I've, I've grown up here and I'm a parent that ran into the challenge of my local high school, Westmont, um, and the district couldn't provide the support for my daughter um, who needs to have some different issues. And I went around and spoke to parents about what's happening in our high schools. And I feel I know a lot about it. Um, and I'm kind of an outsider coming back in. And I think that's what's needed at this time from what I've learned about how the board is functioning and other things that have been going on. And I really Thank hope you. I can help the community. Thank you. And candidate Michael Winter. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And thank you other candidates for also coming tonight. It, it's time out of all of our schedules. I was born and raised in the South Bay, uh, born at Good Sam Hospital when it was just the single tower. I've been married <laughs> for 22 years. I have currently, I have four children and I say currently because we have an exchange student living with us from, from Bonn, Germany. And so she and my twin boys go to Westmont High School where I also graduated uh, from high school, ironically with the current principal. So him and I were in classes together um, at Westmont. Um, I am a former business owner. I owned a successful business in the Valley for more than 10 years. Um, when children announced themselves, my wife and I looked at everything and we said, hey, one of us needs to stay home. And I was happened to luck out and be that one that got to stay home. And I've been staying home with my kids, raising them, educating them, giving them experiences. And when this opportunity of the school board uh, appointment came up in April, I thought, wow, what a great job. And if I could fill it and if I could get it, that'd be wonderful. And it's been very eye-opening to see the inside working of a school district, of a government body, um, has, having never been on the inside of uh, government before. But I understand what it takes to run a business, the finances behind it, the personal skills, contracts, negotiations. So 
I hope I can um, continue on with my appointment for the next four years. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, candidates. That concludes our opening round. And now we're going to move on to those questions that were submitted through the registration process or our league members worked on them or other social media sites. The candidates will have 60 seconds to respond to each question. They'll respond to these in a randomized order so everybody gets the opportunity to go first, middle, and last. And we will start with you, Michael. Our okay. first question is, what steps can the board take to ensure quality teacher recruitment, support, and longevity? The, the big hurdle we have right now is compensation. Um, our, our income for the district is based on property taxes, and it's a, it's a finite number. And I my short tenure here, I've seen it. It, it, we don't have the full resources and the full compensation to attract and retain. Um, so that's a very, very tough issue to tackle when the money is set. We can't earn more money. We can't pull money out of the air, but we can try to make a better environment for the teachers that want to stay and encourage new teachers to come to the school. Um, even if it's just three to five years just to get their feet wet. And hopefully after that, they would like to stay in our district because we have an active parent base. We have a great area to live in. And I think our students are wonderful to work with. Thank you. And Ms. Halliday, you're next. This is a great question. Um, this is a serious need in our district. In the last year, we lost nearly or around 70 teachers who either retired early, went on to other opportunities, or left for other reasons. And a lot of them were science and math teachers. So we really need to look at what we can do to recruit teachers. And a lot of that Michael did bring up. We need to compensate them better. We do actually have the resources to compensate them better and we're just not using them. Um, we also need to improve the working environment. We've had time and time again, they tell us what they need and we need to listen and take action. So if we address those issues and listen to the teachers, they're going to tell us what it takes to keep them. Thank you. And Mr. Savis. Um, yes, similar to, to what the other candidates are saying, it, it, it does boil down to, to compensation because we all know how expensive it is to, to live here, and that's a reality. So it's very difficult also to raise the funds to, to pay these, these teachers what they really deserve. Uh, one thing that, that I'd like to, to add on to what um, Elizabeth mentioned is that we do have to listen to our teachers. And what's been happening with the board, it's been a very contentious relationship, from what I've, I've understood in interviewing with the teachers. Um, and that, that really needs to stop. We need to work together with the teachers. Uh, it doesn't mean we have to agree to everything, but right now it seems that some listening is not going on. Voices aren't being heard, and it seems like there's a polarization between the board and the teachers and even the parents, similar to what's going on in, in current politics, where people are just unable to get together um, to agree on things. And we need to find solutions for these because this is about our children's education. So it's not a political battle. It's a battle for to give our children, our community, the best education possible. Thank you. And Mr. Savis, we're going to begin with you on the next question. <clears throat> the state of California has mandated that every student graduating from high school in approximately five years must have taken a class in ethnic studies. What do you think of this mandate? And where is the district in terms of implementing this mandate? Um, I, I believe that I believe that, that the mandate is important, especially because we live in California, the most diverse state in our nation. And, and I fully support bringing in a program like this. And this is just as important as social studies because you can't understand the history of our country without addressing those different issues. Um, I did find it troubling at first when the, the curriculum was introduced because it left out my own population and that I'm Jewish. And although we're such a low minority, we weren't considered 
minority enough to be included in it. So I wanna make sure that whatever curriculum is presented is fair enough um, across the board and that individuals aren't just cherry picking you know, the stories that we want to share with our children. Um, but, but this is something that is incredibly important um, as we go forward, especially as what our children are hearing in the news and the discussions that are going on in our country. So they have to, to be fully informed. And I believe it's time that we, we take this and begin at the high school level. Thank you. And Mr. Winter, you're next. I, I really don't like the term mandate because we're already leaving a lot of stuff out of our kids' education, and we're requiring a lot of them to graduate. I think having the option to take an ethnic study class like you would do in college, it, it's, a, it's an option. You go down that path of education, and in high school, kids are going down specific paths of, of education, and you mandate something, and you can mandate anything you want in the future. We, we have kids... We're, that are not taking PE. I think PE is much more important. We have kids that don't know how to swim. That's a lifelong skill. So there's there's other things that we could be doing, but mandating ethnic studies, I don't think that's necessary. I think having it as um, an elective class would be much better suited for our high schools. Thank you. And Ms. Holliday? Well, colleges require such classes as ethnic studies and women's studies in their curriculum as part of their graduation requirements for various degrees. And the high school level is pretty much no different. I think it's wonderful that my kids are going to have this opportunity to explore these classes and learn from different perspectives. And I believe that truth in these lessons and the stories of people are incredibly important. And in these stories and in these classes, representation matters. As David also pointed out, you know, he wants to feel represented. And this is just incredibly important, especially for the marginalized students. They need to be seen and heard and to know that they matter too. Thank you. And Ms. Halliday, we're going to start with you on the next question. Are there additional steps you feel the district needs to take to ensure campus security? Yes, one of my kids is, um, you know, he just started as a freshman a few weeks ago and he's quite concerned about safety. So we have a lot of talks about that. I've talked to uh, Mr. Miller at Westmont about this as well. And also Mr. De Caesar. And I, I really have full confidence in them. They work really hard to ensure campus safety. They're out there every morning watching the students come and every afternoon watching them go. There are eyes on the campus. There are adults everywhere. But what I would like to see is I would like to see those social worker roles filled. They're having a hard time filling those positions for social workers and counselors on campus. That would do uh, go a great deal, a great way to ensure the safety and improve the safety on the campus. In addition to having their um, Say Something program that they've been teaching the students how to report when anonymously when they have concerns. Thank you. Thank you. And next, Mr. Sabish. Um, from, from the stories that, that I've heard, not having a child on campus, um, a great a great worry and a great problem has been um, some off-campus safety issues as well, especially you know after football games, or also when uh, Westmont students you know travel to other schools. And there's been some really terrible incidents. I think that um, the schools and the district should really take this uh, seriously. And when there are events, you know, when there are large problems, especially if it's tied to something like a football football game, well, you know, make the community responsible. Cancel the next game. Um, you know, do something in a way drastic so that these things just cannot happen within our community. Um, and I wanna piggyback on what Elizabeth said about the social workers. I read through the budget. We need these individuals to help our students, yet we also need to find the money to bring them in. We, we have to act upon these things. We can't make excuses for it because this, this will help our children's safety. And what else is more important than that? 
So we have to, to find a way to get them in. Thank you, Mr. Winter. So currently on campuses, we have a campus supervisor, which um, their sole job is to walk around and check gates and to roam around the hallways and check on students. Having them supplemented with police officers on campus, I think that's, that's the answer we need. We need them there at the prime times when there's issues on campus, which is not first thing in the morning, it's at lunchtime and it's after school when kids are leaving because the kids come to school in the morning, they're excited, lunch things are set, at lunchtime things are said, tempers boil up after school starts, and that's when we don't have the supervision on campus. And having law enforcement there is different than a campus supervisor. They fill a great role. They're the personal thing. But law enforcement on our campuses would send that extra message of we're not going to tolerate violence. And we already have police officers at our football games, basketball games, and dances. So we're, we are covering our bases. And we just need to fill that void from lunchtime till after school to, to really beef up so that kids see what's going on, that we're trying to protect them. Thank you. And Mr. Winter, we're going to start with you with the next question. You've probably figured out the pattern that these questions are going now. <laughs> um, okay, the next question, <clears throat> a little on the long side, but the district has a stated goal of identifying and disrupting institutional racism. Which part of the current plan do you think is the most effective tool in reaching this goal? And what would you propose if you think something different should happen? Mr. Winter. Wow, that is a mouthful and long question. Yes. Um, the, the, the idea of institutional racism in a high school, um, that's tough to grasp. Our, our, our district is, is more than 60% Hispanic, you know, currently as it stands. Um, I don't think we have a, a history of institutional racism in our high schools. Um, I think if we start treating all the kids as individuals instead of groups, that goes a lot further than trying to say there's institutional bias against certain groups. It's they're, they're people, they're human beings, they're not groups. And when you start clustering people together and you accuse them of group think, you, you isolate people. You need to bring people together. We're all the same. We're in the same goal. We want quality education. We want safe campuses. And we want our kids to succeed. And if they succeed, they succeed. They don't need to be put into a group and bombarded with historical racism. Thank you. And next, Ms. Halliday. This is a really good and very timely question given the situations that are happening all over the nation, all over the world. And I think that first we need to recognize and accept that institutional racism does exist. We need to look at our history and we need to see the truth, even if it's not what we like or what makes us comfortable. And in schools, we need to accept and have truth in our curriculum and uncensorship. We need to have access to these materials and give the teachers the freedom to teach the truth and to teach what is right. It is clear looking at the statistics of our AP classes as well as the graduation statistics and other information that we do have equity issues that we need to iron out. We need to bring the level up for everybody for all of our students and give them the same access to opportunities. Thank you. Mr. Sabas. Uh, yes, thank you for this important question. Um, I, a couple of parts to this. I, beside, you know, we have to understand uh, racism in the country and as a school district as well, we have to understand why there are such uh, disparaging numbers within different um, groups. What we want to make sure is that every group has the same equal opportunity for, um, you know, as you said, half of our students are Hispanics. We need to make sure we have ESL courses. We need to make sure that we have support. Um, if there's concern about teachers having just an inherent bias against a student because of how they look or who they are, 
They can do something that some law schools do where on a test, a person puts down a number. It's not their particular name. A teacher would know which student that was. So if there were those biases, and I really doubt there are in our community, but then those wouldn't um, come out. Um, and the other thing we need to do is we need to reach out and I have a lot of stories from our, our current generation of students. What have their experiences been? Do they feel this? Do they feel they have the equal opportunity or do they feel like they're being put in boxes and treated differently, which cannot happen? Thank you. <clears throat> and our next question, Mr. Sabus, will begin with you. What do you consider both the most positive and the most negative takeaway from for the Campbell Union High School District as a result of the COVID pandemic? So both a positive and a negative takeaway. Um, being an outsider from the, the school experience, the most positive takeaway I could say is that I didn't hear a lot of statistics of teachers getting very, very sick, of students getting very, very sick. Um, and generally, you know, there, there were nothing tragic happened during that time. But the one thing that was tragic was that there was really miscommunication um, between the board and between parents and between teachers. And I heard there was a, a great conflict um, trying to figure out a policy, trying to change the policy, uh, complex finding out what was best for the students. And, you know, I'm getting anecdotal information from, from people or I'm reading information of things that have been posted. And also I've seen some of the YouTube videos and part of my reason for thinking I would be a, a, a good member of the board is I'm an outsider who I didn't participate in all of those things. And I wanna bring the board and parents and teachers and students together to trust one another again, because I feel during, during the COVID pandemic, a lot of trust was broken. Thank you. Mr. Winter? So I, I figured, I think it, that whole year the school was shut down was a complete waste for all the students. Having my two students in the house and seeing what was going on was, there was no education. They were, they were babysat. There was no real work produced. And I, I felt there was a detriment to their education, what they did. There was a complete overreaction to what was going on. Um, I think not just in our district, nationwide, people were hypersensitive to everything. People were made to be scared and that we just need to put it behind us and move forward. We know what happened in the past with COVID, so we're now better prepared for the future. And hopefully something like that doesn't happen again, where we're sticking kids at home, where a majority of the kids didn't even sign on for classes. Teachers didn't know where they were, but mm -hmm. they were given credit for those classes and they were moved forward without any evaluation of where they were as a student. And that was horrible what happened to all those kids. We had kids that moved on to the next grade just because they logged in once and that was an education. Thank you. And Ms. Halliday? Well, my students, my kids were in the Moreland School District when the shutdown happened. And I um, started also taking online classes. So while they were doing their online classes, so was I. I got to learn the Canvas system that the students are now currently using. And I got to learn uh, the Google Classroom and other tools that Moreland was using with my students. I also have some friends who are teachers in the Campbell Union High School District. And I know that they worked really hard and they stepped up along with all of the other teachers to provide education to these students during some very challenging times. Hindsight is 2020, we didn't know what to expect. We had to follow the county and state guidelines and rules. And as a result, we came out of this pretty in pretty good um, uh, spot. I see the bridge programs over the summer that the school is offering. I would really like to see some percentages and real statistics of how many students did attend in the pandemic times of our school district. Thank you. And we'll start with you on our next question. What would you, Ms. Halliday, what would you propose to address the mental health issues faced by students and staff after the COVID pandemic? That's a wonderful question. Um, because I see, you know, it's like our students are expected to go back to high school, some of them 
you know, not ever experienced in high school and just ride that wave and jump on board and perform and get great grades and keep up with their work. And their mental health really does need to be addressed as well as the staff. We've all been through a crisis and we're still not completely out of it. There are funds already allocated and budgeted for, for these social workers. And we just need to fill those positions. We need more counselors in the school. Maybe we can get some grants and we need to invest in our students now so that we can address the learning loss. We've got funds from the state and the federal levels that are specifically targeted toward addressing these current students. They are our customers now and we need to see to their needs and nurture their strengths and feed where they need to be fed. Thank you, Mr. Sabus. Um, what I would do first is, is I understand the great, great need for our, for social workers to come in, but almost like, you know, on day one, at the beginning of the year, they should, someone should have set up a program to take some time for every, every grade to go into at least one class and speak to the, speak to the students, hand out a survey, find someone or find an appointed faculty member where students are able to freely express their ideas. Um, same with the teachers. Um, in high school, especially in a large high school, students often don't have a way to find their voice and they internalize everything um, alone. And then people like, like on a board, we just assume what they're going through. We don't know for certain, right? So we need to find a way for the students to, to be able to reach out to faculty and to discuss um, these issues, but to do it, this is happening now. This isn't happening. Let's make a budget. Let's do it next year. Let's think about it. There's a real urgency to this because we're going to lose not just, you know, with one generation to missing school, it's going to just continue. And education is in crisis. And we need to help our students. Thank you. Mr. Winter? I believe the students are, are handling it pretty well. If we can just, um, just move forward past the pandemic. We're not in a pandemic anymore. We're endemic now. Um, statistics show that more people currently die of pneumonia than they're dying of COVID. So we just need to go forward. We have a well, well, uh, wellness center on every campus right now. If students are feeling stressed, they can go there at any time of the day and, and talk to somebody. We're in the process of getting social workers filling these positions. It's a tough road because we're trying to find two social workers for each campus. Uh, the district is working on it. And I think that's where we need to go. Start treating the kids normal. We're not in a pandemic. We don't need to scare them anymore. And if they need help, there's help on campus. There's trusted teachers, the wellness center, and anybody that they really choose to talk to is open to talk to them. That's what the, the teachers have said. They'll talk to any student. It just doesn't need to be a specific person. And then they can give that student the guidance to seek for um, more help if necessary. Thank you. And we're going to start with you, Mr. Winter. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. We've been dealing with some heavy questions. So I'm going to give you a light one. And our timer, we're just going to give 30 seconds on their responses for this one. And so, Mr. Winter, could you share with us one of your most memorable experiences from your own high school career? Wow, from my own high school career. So I was on, I joined the wrestling team my freshman year, just because my brother had been on the wrestling team when he, when he had been there and they had this wonderful coach, coach McClary. I didn't think I could handle it. I dropped out after four weeks. That man followed me on my bike in his MGV convertible yelling at me to get back to school, to get back in the wrestling room. And you're not a flake mm -hmm. that sunk in that, that made me in my head. Don't quit. Keep doing something. If you quit, you never learn something new. Great. Ms. Halliday? Um, I was vice president of my school's DECA club. And um, I was really into marketing and, and fashion design. I had a really wonderful advisor and we took a trip to San Diego to compete um, after I uh, placed in the finals in the state level. And it was just a really wonderful experience that um, we had job interviews and we had all of these great experiences that helped prepare us for our future. Thank you. And Mr. Sabus? Yeah, um, I went to Saratoga High School 
And I had a moment in my sophomore year chemistry teacher. Um, he would start every new chapter in chemistry where he would take out a record player and he would play this song, Magical Mystery Tour by the Beatles, every single new chapter. And he explained to us that learning was a journey um, and for us to get excited about learning something new. And I was able to get through that class where I was not a science kid. I was much more interested in fun high school things. I did well in the class and I took that upon when I speak to other students about learning in every subject thereafter, that it is, you should get excited because learning something new is a gift. Thank you, thank you. And now uh, we'll switch back to one more heavy question and then we'll go on to our last question. So, and we'll start with Mr. Sabus. <clears throat> Campbell Union High School District, like many other districts, is facing yearly budget challenges. What ideas do you have that could help them address these challenges? Um, one of the things I spoke to a parent about is, I don't know all the details, but I know that the, the district owns some facilities and in other um, recreational facilities and other things. And I know in other districts, they've been able to rent them out to, um, to individuals. And so they're able to earn money um, that way. Um, another thing is, is living in the district, I've never received notice of any type of fundraiser whatsoever. I've never had an ask from the district. I couldn't even, even, even tell you if the district was struggling for money before I researched it and knew about it, if there was someone coming in. There's people who move here because it's so expensive to live here. They think, hey, the schools must have money. I'm paying so much in property taxes. And then when they bring their, school to, their child to the school, they are I, I, amazed or just they can't understand why the schools don't have enough money. So I think there needs to be education about that. And I think that the district could really find some new ways to, to fundraise, to, you know, to earn money itself, um, and even find out the proper place there needs to, to be some corners cut that don't affect the students directly. Thank you. And Mr. Winter? So you're, you're right, the district, you know, their hands are tied. It's, it's property taxes is our primary fund, but we do rent out properties that are underutilized. Um, the district reacquired the Heritage Office Building, which was Old Campbell Elementary on Campbell Avenue. That is a income generator for the district. We just signed a multi-year lease with Stratford School to rent out the entire Blackford campus. That's a revenue stream coming into the district. But we don't have a lot of facilities to rent out. Uh, we currently rent out our pools to um, after school sports and weekend sports. We rent our sports facilities to outside groups. So we do have money that does come in, but that just offsets the operating cost. It's we're really tied to property tax and we really have to watch our pennies when we do budgeting so we can allocate money where it needs to be best spent. We are using our assets. <laughs> you look at the budget and you look at the revenues where the money comes from and you can see very clearly where our revenue stream comes from and what we do have. And the district does have a foundation that people have generously given to and still do continue to give to. Thank you. Ms. Holliday? I've been um, paying some careful attention to the budget over the school board meetings, especially in the last one where they presented the budget actuals. And there is roughly about 20 to $30 million of unspent money um, that comes up in these budget actuals every year at the end of the summer. And um, one of the ways that they're being creative with their budget is sometimes cutting the funding from special education services and English language learners, which I really hate to see that happen because I have a, a, a special place in my heart for these students who need extra supports. Um, we do rent out facilities, we do rent out for activities and one of the safety issues or concerns that Mr. Sabus brought up earlier happened actually between some parties that were not affiliated with our school district. It was from those rentals of the facilities. So we need to be cautious, but the income is nice. I think our school board and um, I think they're doing a really fine job working on that budget. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to that last question and you'll have 90 seconds to respond. And the question I'll repeat, and let me tell you the order also reversed from, pretty much reversed from the opening statement. Mr. Sabis, you're going first. 
Mr. Winter, you'll be going second, and Ms. Halliday, you'll be going third. Okay, so let me repeat the question, and it's 90 seconds. What question do you wish you had been asked tonight? Why? And how would you have responded? And we'll begin with Mr. Sabus. Um, I wish I was asked about some of the, the turmoil that some parents and some in the community feel that there was between the board, parents, teachers, and students. Um, that, that's the majority of feedback that I've gotten or things that I've, I've read, things that I've watched on, on YouTube. Um, so I, I would, what, what I first would do is as a member of the board, speak with other board members as to how to handle meetings and how to handle when parents are speaking and when teachers are communicating um, and even when students are trying to have their voices heard. Um, there really is some, some disconnect and there's some respect that I feel is, is not there. Um, the other thing that I, I'd like to find a way to do is for the, the board to find ways to also reach out to students, to find out not just you know, views of what's going on on the campus from teachers um, or from parents, but students' voices really need to be heard and to either um, have some forums, an online forum, or some place where you know, our students feel that their voices are heard, but then also, so then, then the board can act and we're supposed to be acting on their behalf. Um, as Elizabeth kind of mentioned that students are our customers in a way, right? But also as, as parents, we want our students to get the best education possible so they can have the best future possible. And I think that sometimes that gets lost or then sometimes there can be personality or group conflicts. And I want to I want to go in there as kind of a, a peacemaker to generate excitement for the board to move forward. Thank you. And next will be Mr. Winter. So the question that pops into my mind that wasn't asked is, what could I do to make the board better? What could I do to make the to the functioning of the board better? And I think one of the big ones would be, like we've seen across the country, term limits that you can't sit on a board for 25 years. You, um, um, that that you term out. So we get new blood in, we get new ideas, we get new faces, we get new personalities, because that what will make a board more creative, um, problem solving and all that. Um, and I also believe you should have a vested interest. I know this one would be a push. If you don't have a school age kid, you shouldn't be on the board. I, I really believe that parents are the best educators and a parent is going to be looking out for their kids in the long run. So if you have a if you have parents that are on the board, they're going to be the ones that are looking out number one for their for their kid and for the education that's going on around them. Whereas opposed to somebody that doesn't have a kid that may be using a board position to ladder climb. I, oh, I'm on a school board now. I can be city council now. I can be this. That's the worst thing I've seen. I'm not on our board in other boards um, in the valley, and I, I think that's a horrible thing to do to students and to do to a school district is to just be there for a short time just to get your name out there and to move up. I can say for myself, I don't plan to go anywhere else. You know, I'm, I'm planning on if I get elected four years and I'm done. Um, you know, that's, there needs to be new blood. There needs to be changeover. And those are, those are the things that I wish were asked of me. Thank you. And our third candidate, uh, Ms. Halliday. So for those who um, may, I mean, my name's right there, but I wanted to remind everybody, my name is Elizabeth Halliday and you will see our names on your ballots if you live in Presti area two. So there does seem to be some confusion about how we've broken up the district into Presti areas. So if you see our three names on the ballot, you're in Presti area two. Um, the question that I wish I was asked is, what am I doing to prepare for this job? I've got my website up. I've got endorsements, the sole endorsements from the Democratic um, activists for Women Now and the Santa Clara County Democratic Party from US Representative Anna Eshu and from people who have served on the county school board, uh, the Board of Education, Anna Song and um, Rosemary Kame. I've got a lot of other endorsements that I've been working on and I've been listening to them and learning. I see the stop. So no, that's I'll, not you. I'm sorry. Oh, but sorry. The timer. But the I have timer been for, uh, Yes. Okay. okay. Have you have some more time. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
I've been listening to them and getting advice from the experts and really just absorbing it like a sponge. I've been listening to the teachers. I've been meeting with the student board members and listening to their concerns. And they all have really valuable input. And I would like to see more transparency on the board. Like Michael was pointing out, I don't wanna see career politicians. When they appoint somebody for the um, position in trustee area five on Tuesday at a special board meeting, I want to see them choose somebody who really has the interests of our students, special needs students, English language learners, and all students at heart. Thank you very much. And thank you, candidates. We wish you well in your campaign and greatly respect all of you for standing up and running for school board. Um, such an important office, somebody who was involved in public education for 42 years. I respect board members. I respect community members who are willing to stand up and go out there and try to get elected and then do the very best job they can. So thank you for your participation tonight. And now before we close, of course, the league wants to remember or wants to remind all of our attendees, the general election is coming up on November 8th. And as one of our candidates just mentioned in the Campbell Union High School District, you do vote by area and the candidates you met tonight are area two, those three will be on your ballot. You won't see any other areas except the one that you're in. So look for the names, look for the people that you heard tonight. So again, remember to vote on or before November 8th. Next slide, please. And I want to promote again Voters Edge, which is a um, collaboration between the League of Women Voters and MapLight. It's a nonpartisan uh, information site where you can find information about candidates, measures, and campaign financing. I hope all of our candidates tonight were approached by Voters Edge because they have three general questions that they ask all candidates to respond to and then the rest is optional whether you want to go further. But I know league members very much use Voters Edge when they want to review some things about candidates. And it also gives you additional information about ballot measures and particularly about campaign financing. Very easy to use. You enter your street address or your zip code and you get a copy of your ballot to look at. Next slide, please. And I do want to remind everybody, please vote on or before November 8th. Democracy is not a spectator sport. We welcome you to join us and to look to the League of Women Voters of Southwest Santa Clara Valley for help with or information about our upcoming election. Again, thank you very much, candidates, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Good night. Thank you Good night. very Thank much. You. Good night.